Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Stephen Bida, uh, assistant professor of history at the University of Oregon. He joined the faculty in 2017. Bida's research interests include 20th century U.S. history, labor history, and environmental history. He has a particular interest in the Pacific Northwest, timber workers, and working class radicalism in the American West. Bita's current book project is Strong Winds and Widowmakers, A History of Workers, Nature, and Environmental Conflict in the Pacific Northwest Timber Country, 1900 to the Present. Thanks, Steve, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So let's start at the beginning. What led to your interest in labor and environmental history in the Pacific Northwest? All right. So I had been interested in labor history going back to my kind of early days as an, as an undergrad. Um, I thought the radicalism and some of the stories of labor protest were, were always fascinating. Um, but I actually didn't become interested in the environmental side of it until I moved out to the Northwest. I did my graduate work at University of Washington. And in addition to being in graduate school, and in addition to being a student, um, I also love to fish. I love to hunt. So if you fish and hunt in the Northwest, that means you, you end up spending a lot of time in rural communities, old logging towns. And also, if you fish and hunt in, in the Northwest, you're going to run into a lot of, a lot of timber workers. And so I, I would continually run into loggers, retired loggers, you know, chatting with them by the side of the river, you know, how's the fish, any luck catching anything. But I noticed a lot of them, um, you know, talked with, they talked in ways about the environment that I, I kind of had associated with middle class environmentalists, you know, emphasizing the aesthetics, emphasizing, a desire to protect it. And that's kind of when something clicked with me that, you know, all workers, but especially timber workers, that they see the forests as more than just a site of labor. They also see it as a site of recreation, mm -hmm. a site of subsistence at times, but also very much central to their community. And so that kind of led me to more explore the environmental dimensions of it. Um, and then also too, I think what attracted me to kind of combining labor and environmental history was that this is a relatively new growing field, and I think some of the historians w looking to combine labor and environmental history are doing some very interesting things that are telling us more about the environment and telling us more about labor. Um, and as, you know, with an interest in both, I, I was very much attracted to, you know, what labor can tell us about nature and, and vice versa. So let's talk about the book project. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, um, tell me about the title, Strong sure. Winds and Widowmakers. So, so the title comes from a song by Buzz Martin, he was known as the singing logger in the 1960s, early <laughs> 1970s. He was kind of like the Merle Haggard of timber country. He struck a very defiant tone, a very prideful tone, and his music came at a crucial moment in the industry's history when it was just entering a major recession, there were new attacks from the environmental movement, and so it really spoke to kind of you know, the pride that people had in their communities and their work and their job and this, you know, the sense that we're not gonna, we're not gonna give in, we're not gonna go down without a fight. So, I, you know, that's what the song's about, that's what a lot of Buzz Martin's music is about and I just thought it was a interesting title because Strong Winds and Widowmakers, or Widowmaker is a, it's a logger's term for um, a falling branch that, that can injure a logger. Mm -hmm. um, so it spoke to the work but it also spoke to this sense of community and also sense of defiance that would develop later in the 20th century. So, so that's where the title comes from. So yeah. tell me, give me a sense of the overall mm -hmm. argument of yeah. the book. So the overall argument of the book is that loggers are and always have been environmentalists. And of course there's, there's a lot to untangle there. But what I argue and what I examine is the ways in which timber workers have always, or excuse me, what I explore, what I examine is the ways in which nature has been at the center of timber workers' politics as well as sense of community and how their politics throughout the 20th century from the union movements of the 1930s and 40s all the way up to some of the conflicts with environmentalists in the 70s and 80s have been very much about protecting nature and protecting their sense of place and their, their claim to the forest. So, so let's, let's start with um, the, that point about mm -hmm. um, What's the relationship between this environmental consciousness that you find mm -hmm. about uh, uh, among early 20th century mm -hmm. timber workers and the the union movement among timber workers? Yeah. How did that develop? Yeah, one of the the drives for the labor movement in the 1930s and 40s were, you know, there's a lot of commonalities between the labor movement in the Northwest Woods and elsewhere that height of the depression, you know, declining wages, job cuts. And so what pushes a lot of timber workers into the labor movement is the same thing that pushed 
workers throughout North America in the labor movement. Um, but at the same time, as soon as the, the labor movement kind of gets going in the 1930s and 40s, timber workers are very committed to not just protecting their jobs, but also protecting nature. So the major union I study, the International Woodworkers of America, the IWA, they were founded in 1937, and immediately after they're founded, they start taking a stand and start advocating for the creation of Olympic National Park. And that tradition would continue through their, throughout their whole history of advocating for wilderness, advocating for restrictions to cutting. They were a major supporter of the 1964 Wilderness Act. Um, so part of what was really driving unionism was this, you know, workers wanted a say and they wanted some power to, to impact how the forests were used and they wanted some say in mandating wilderness and mandating, you know, making sure that there were areas that, areas that, yeah, they could cut, but also areas that they could go and hunt and fish and take their families to. So you've, you've implied mm -hmm. why your work is important because that's a story I would think it's fair to say almost all American environmentalists do not know. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that. <laughs> sure. So you, you, you started by saying, you know, the, the labor movement happens in the timber industry for reasons similar to why it's happening mm -hmm. all over the place. One of the things that's interesting about your work is the way you illuminate for us or recover for us a complexity in these movements mm -hmm. that, um, that we may be less familiar with. So on the one hand, I know, for example, that you, you talk about um, working classes as a plurality. Mm -hmm. So say a little bit about the, the sort of distinctions between the working classes. At right. Time. Yeah, so, you know, I think this is true in, in most American history, but especially the 20th century, is that, you know, American workers have long been divided by ethnicity, long been divided by race, long been divided by gender, divided by occupation, skilled versus unskilled. Um, divided by rural versus urban status. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's ever accurate to talk about the work, the American working class. Sometimes we labor historians, we, we try and find a kind of singular class in which workers overcome racial divisions and ethnic divisions, and there are moments when that happens. But, you know, for, for the most part, the American working class has been very, very fractured. And so, yeah, why I emphasize classes instead of a singular class is that we have to think about race, we have to think about ethnicity, we have to think about gender, and what my work does a lot of, of thinking about kind of ruralness and how that impacts the ways workers understand themselves as a class, as a community, and that also impacts how they see themselves in relation to both employers as well as the rest of the kind of you know, political landscape. So let's talk about some of those divisions. Mm -hmm. You raised the uh, rural-urban mm -hmm. divide. So say a little bit about the, the sort of general distinctions you find between rural uh, union members and, and um, urban union mm -hmm. members. This was definitely more pointed or, or kind of more apparent in the, in the earlier 20th century is that, uh, especially here in the Northwest, urban, or yeah, urban, Union members, especially World War One and then definitely in World War Two, as industry built up in the northwestern cities, the shipbuilding industry, Boeing, um, a lot of the wartime industry, those workers were paid extremely, extremely well, and so too were timber workers and other rural workers in the mid 20th century. Um, but as the wages of urban workers increased and they could afford cars and they had more vacation time, they started going into you know, rural communities for, for vacation and they started to see forests as recreational spaces. And timber workers too saw them as recreational spaces, but they also saw them as, as workspaces. And so that created new tensions about how do you manage nature, what do you privilege in the management of nature, do you privilege production, do you privilege recreation? And so that created a lot of divides between the working class here in the Northwest, the urban versus rural working class. Now, one of the things I kind of reveal in my work is that, you know, those categories could shift or based on, you know, the pressure that some groups could apply. So in the 1940s, there was a big effort by the IWA to enact new, very significant cutting restrictions. They ultimately failed in that, but they were able to swing some urban workers in the Northwest, but also nationally, more to the cause, more to kind of their working class environmentalism cause. So, so it definitely shifts, and that's the thing too with, with all these categories, race, ethnicity, gender, they're, they're constantly shifting, mm -hmm. which means 
class is constantly shifting or the meanings of class is constantly shifting. So in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. we know now one of the things that, that's come home to us as uh, people who live in Oregon mm -hmm. uh, is the history of racism in the state mm -hmm. of Oregon. And, and in particular, the kind of vitality of the KKK during this period Absolutely, that you yeah. study. So talk a little bit about the role that the KKK played, the, the Ku Klux Klan played in at this time or around uh, the labor union movement. Yeah, so in some regards, and this is another, I think, important division between kind of urban and rural workers. So the, the Oregon Klan in the 1920s, it, it transcended class. It was a working class movement, a middle class movement, an upper class movement. Um, it was both urban and rural. Um, it was very entrenched in Oregon's political system. Um, so that, that kind of created one of the other divides between, um, you know, rural workers and urban workers. So most of most timber workers were, were immigrants. Many of them came from Scandinavia. Many of them came from Italy and Eastern Europe. Many of them were Catholic, which the 20s era clan very much you know, was opposed to, or opposed to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, whereas urban workers tended to be more native born, tended to be white. There were, of course, plenty of workers of color in Portland and Seattle, but workers represented in unions were overwhelmingly white. and. At certain points, especially in Portland, we see some alliances between the Klan and the more conservative elements of organized labor. So that creates a new division that uh, urban workers aligned with the Klan are advocating for anti-immigration policies, anti-Catholic policies, anti or pro-public school policies. Um, and what they're doing then is attacking many of the immigrant working class communities that you know, grew up around the, the timber industry in, in rural Oregon. So uh, let's also talk about um, the role of um, women in mm -hmm. the timber industry. What, what, what kind of jobs did they do and how were they yeah. involved in the labor movement? Yeah, so this is another fascinating thing I uncovered in the course of my research is, right, we think timber workers, we think very masculine men, you know, hyper masculinity, and, and that was definitely part of timber working culture. Um, but when the industry emerged in the early 20th century, I mean, there had been a timber industry prior to the early 1900s here in Oregon, but it was, it was very small. And starting with Weyerhaeuser's purchase in 1905, that, that leads to a, a massive explosion um, of industrial logging. And so when, when companies start kind of moving out here and establishing logging operations, one of the first things they realize is that there's not enough people here to, you know, to support an industrial logging operation. So they start recruiting a lot of, of people. Now, one of the things that early 20th century lumbermen were really, really worried about was radical labor unionism. Early 20th century, there was the IWW, a very radical union. There were, you know, there was the Pullman strike in the 1890s, a lot of very high profile, often violent strikes. So when timber workers, or excuse me, when lumbermen are building up this new infrastructure, they want to make sure it's as peaceful and as free of industrial strife as possible. And one of the ways they do that, or one of the things they reason is that, oh, a lot of these other labor problems have been caused by single men. They have no responsibilities. So yeah. They'll just go off on strike. They don't have to worry about feeding a family. And so lumbermen reason that if we have women, if, if we recruit married workers with wives, those workers aren't going to just go on strike. They aren't going to engage in labor activism because they have to worry about feeding their families. So lumbermen, they build company towns with single family houses, with schools, all these things to attract timber workers. And that makes women very much a part of these communities from the get go. Mm -hmm. And when the big labor organizing drives happen in the 30s and 40s, Women are very much at the center of this because what they argue, and this is not unique to the Northwest Woods, but what they argue is that, you know, a poor paycheck affects us just as much, if not more, than the men. You know, we have to take that paycheck, we have to feed children, we have to take care of the home. We want a, we want our husbands earning high wages. Um, so women very much kind of provide some of the radical impulses of the 1930s and 1940s labor movement that they are not only pushing their men or pushing their husbands into the union, they are also taking control of some elements of organizing drives and pushing them in more radical directions. So this this uh, more radical directions also raises the question of socialism and communism mm -hmm. in in the labor movement in the Pacific Northwest. Absolutely. Tell us about that story. Yeah. So there, you know, one of the distinctive things about the Northwest history, one of the things that makes it such a fun region to study, <laughs> is that there's a long history of radicalism here, a long history of socialism. A uh, long history of utopian communities and anarchist communities. Um, so yeah, there had always been a, a radical presence in the Northwest and a radical presence in the woods. Um, 
So a lot of kind of scholars have talked about the influence of the IWW in the Northwest. I actually find that some of that's been overstated. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a period kind of in the 19-teens when the IWW is actively organizing timber workers, pushing the, you know, the industry's workers in more radical directions. And then with the first Red Scare after you know, World War I, um, the repression of the, the Wobblies, there's pretty much kind of a, a vacuum, a labor, a vacuum created in labor radicals in the 20s. And there had been kind of these elements of the Communist Party, these kind of small cells of the Communist Party, which grew out of the Socialist Party um, after the Russian Revolution. Um, and they actually are one of the few groups actually doing a lot of kind of organizing in the 1920s. And then with the 1930s, new labor legislation and the kind of new, you know, ups, upwell of labor radicalism, communists kind of then step out from behind the shadows and, and take a more active role in organizing. Now, it's, this is one of those things that kind of historians argue about is to what extent did most timber workers actually believe in communism? Mm -hmm. What I find, um, and again, you know, it, it's tricky and it's complicated, but what I find is that most timber workers were drawn to communism not necessarily because it was this radical critique of capitalism, though there were certainly some of those workers. It's just that uh, the Communist Party was one of the few groups doing, doing anything in the late 20s and early 1930s, and what attracted timber workers was, you know, the, the promise of organization, the, the promise of having some control of not only the work, but also some control over how the forests are managed. And so that's why they, they gravitate to the, the party. But it, it was a, con you know, the party was contentious all throughout the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. Um, and the IWA, the union I study, is a very fraught relationship with communism, is that it's organized by communists, but then well before the kind of restrictive labor legislation of the, the 1940s, they kind of push communists out. So. so tell us a little bit about the way these tensions get manifested between different labor organizations. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about that. Part yeah, so again, it goes back to this idea of classes rather than a single class. Um, so right, skill has, has long divided um, labor unions. So in the Northwest as elsewhere, the industrial unions of the 1930s and 1940s were very much at odds with the skilled unions in the American Federation of Labor. Um, because, you know, the American Federation of Labor believed that labor would be more, po or the labor movement would be more powerful if it was more exclusive. So they said only native born white men, only skilled workers, that way we can demand wages based on whiteness, we can demand wages based on skill. And they thought that allowing women, allowing unskilled workers, wor allowing workers of color into their ranks would very much dilute labor's prestige and therefore dilute its power. Whereas the IW, and th this is where it gets tricky, and this is where as a labor historian you gotta be careful about <laughs> talking in acronyms. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I'll do this in my classes and I'll see my students eyes glaze over, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just spouting off acronyms. Yeah. But the IWA was a member of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, which was a very different view of unionism. They said unionism will be more powerful if unions are inclusive rather than exclusive. So in addition to allowing some skilled workers, they also opened their doors to unskilled workers. They opened their doors to immigrants, to workers of color, to women. And so that created a huge divide in the Northwest as elsewhere between, you know, one group of organized labor that wanted to be inclusive and one group that wanted to be very inclusive. Um, and they also debated over, you know, things like race, um, you know, the CIO and the IWA as well, very committed to civil rights unionism. They said a union's job isn't simply to advocate for wages, hours, and working conditions. They said a union's job is to make the country a better place. Uh, and, you know, historians have called it social movement unionism. And the AFL thought that was, you know, a fool's errand. They thought that that was only going to complicate labor politics and make it more difficult to organize for um, better wages uh, on the job. So, hmm. yeah. so I'm going to switch gears a sure. little bit. So um, describe a time when loggers and environmentalists had similar goals. Yeah. Is there such a time? Absolutely. From roughly the 1930s to 19, mid 1960s. Um, so what we have to understand about environmentalism in the early 20th century is that it looked very different than it does today. So environmentalists of the mid 20th century, many of them came from rural communities, you know, Aldo Leopold and Howard Zahnheiser, who was going to be the you know, head of the Wilderness Society. Zahnheiser, I believe, came from rural Pennsylvania, coal country in rural, rural Pennsylvania. So they had a view of rural communities very different than many environmentalists from urban areas have today. Um, 
many of early environmentalists too had had kind of one foot in you know the industry. So Aldo Leopold famously was was a forester for the U.S. Forest Service, right. and he was very critical of the Forest Service, but he also understood the important role played by timber production. That you know our houses and all our furniture is made from lumber. Um, so I think those two things very much created, not necessarily you know they weren't necessarily coming from the same. Well, they were in some regards coming from the same communities, but they understood one another, is that these environmentalists understood where the rural workers were coming from and the rural workers understood where the environmentalists were coming from. So that created a lot of common ground. So yeah, throughout the 1930s, a lot of big pieces of environmental legislation or new wilderness protections were accomplished through a coalition of workers and environmentalists. So I mentioned earlier the um, effort to um, create Olympic National Park. That was pushed by many environmental groups and workers. And we see that all throughout the 1950s. Um, Three Sisters Wilderness here in Oregon, that was a product of a coalition, uh, the Wilderness Society working with the IWA, um, and up until the 1964 Wilderness Act, uh, that was passed with the support of the IWA as well as the support of um, the Wilderness Society. And actually, um, Frank Church, who was one of the architects of the Wilderness Act, as well as um, several other senators throughout, um, throughout the country, they said that having timber worker support for the Wilderness Act, Act was key to the bill's passage because you had timber companies coming out and saying like, oh, this is gonna kill jobs, this is gonna kill the timber industry, we're not gonna have any lumber for homes. And they were able to point to the workers and say, no, we got workers right here saying they want this and this is not gonna kill their jobs. And so that kind of helped push it through. So, so. what? What went wrong? <laughs> that is what I spend roughly the last <laughs> half of my book uh, kind of <laughs> dissecting. So, um, you know, one of the things that many historians have kind of look, uh, looked at this before, have emphasized, is the environmental movement changes. It becomes less urban, or excuse me, it becomes less rural, more urban. And as people from cities, th they have a very different view about kind of nature. They, they tend to see it more as a recreational space, and they don't make as much room for production. So. You know, an environmentalist from Portland or Seattle drives out to timber country for a weekend backpacking trip and they see a clear cut and they're like, oh my God, this is horrible, which a fresh clear cut does indeed seem alarming. Um, but what they, you know, didn't factor in was that, you know, a clear cut, all forests are dynamic spaces and, and those will change and they'll regrow. Um, and also what they often failed to consider was that uh, the lumber their houses were built out came from that clear cut. Um, so they start very much you know, emphasizing that we have to protect nature for aesthetic purposes, for recreational purposes, and that pretty much pushes production or people who want to advocate for production out, which pushes workers out. So that's one of the main thing other historians have looked at, something I absolutely agree with. The other thing, though, that I pay attention to in my book is popular culture, mm -hmm. is that if you look at cultural products from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, timber workers are very much championed as not only progressive, but also environmentally progressive. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the 60s with books like Sometimes a Great Notion, we start seeing this view of rural workers broadly, but timber workers specifically as reactionary, as, as stuck in the past, as part of this outmoded frontier culture. And when environmentalists start encountering timber workers, they're bringing those popular cultural ideas with them. You know, when they see a timber worker, they're not seeing someone with a long history, or part of a community that has a long history of environmental protection, they're seeing the stampers from sometimes a great notion. Um, so I think, yeah, they, they get this new image in their mind of who timber workers are that doesn't line up with reality, but it was, that is how they were encountering these communities was, was through popular culture that you know, said one very specific thing that wasn't necessarily true. So what can we do to heal this rift? <laughs> That's another great question. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it, it's a complex question. I, I think one of the most important things is, is, is talking, is, you know, for both sides to see that the other are not their mortal enemies. You know, so I talked about kind of timber or environmentalists having a view of timber workers based on popular culture. Something happens too in timber working communities. We talk, you know, that's where Buzz Martin's work comes in, is, right. is kind of defining insiders versus outsiders and everyone who's not part of this community is an enemy. Um, so I, I think we have to, to get past that, and one of the ways you, you do that is through talking. Um, and I think one of the ways you do that is through collaborative partnerships. So just before kind of we started filming, we were talking about Peter Walker's excellent new book about Harney County and about the history of collaboration. And I think what went on in Har Harney County that 
ranchers and environmentalists and members from the Burns Paiute tribe and all these people getting together who had long been enemies, agreeing to sit down and have difficult conversations, I, I think that's a first step. And as we can see in Harney County, it's, it's really paid dividends. So to the extent that politicians, environmentalists, and working class communities can facilitate those sorts of, of very difficult but very necessary collaborative discussions, I think that's the way we move forward. Um, but again, there, there's challenges here. We have, you know, since the this kind of conflict has been growing since, since the 60s, so there's 50 years of history and 50 years of acri acrimony to overcome. So I'm not saying it's easy. Um, and again, I, I always try and push my students past platitudes, and it seems like a platitude to say, like, oh, just get everyone in a room and sit mm -hmm. down. But again, I, I, I would point to Harney County and say that as simplistic as that sounds, we see there that it can have results if, if people commit to it. And that's what it, I think it'll take is, is all the sides committing to having these very difficult conversations about how to manage the forests in the future. So we've got two minutes left. All right. Last question. Sure. Um, how, are you, how are you making this case in your classes? How, how do you bring this into the classroom? Mm. Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, Oh man, you had to save that one with only two minutes left. Yeah, yeah give me the, the uh, well, concise. Point. Yeah, I mean, so I think mostly what I do is try and introduce them to sources that they wouldn't encounter about environmentalism. So introducing, the, you know, having them read some sources from the Timber Workers Union that are talking about environmentalism and getting them to consider the ways in which, you know, the way that they may be thinking about who is an, isn't an environmentalist, you know, might be flawed. I also encourage them to see some of these shortcomings of the ways in which environmentalism is usually construed. Um, you know, one of the things I always say in my classes and what many of my lesson plans are designed to get students to think about is the ways in which environmental policy has very real social implications and getting to think about what are the so social implications of an environmental policy and seeing sometimes the, the hidden consequences of an environmental policy um, and again, getting them to talk about what social consequences might be and how do we think more holistically about social policy and environmental policy. So. Well, um, that effort may help uh, to bridge that divide over mm -hmm. time. Maybe that generation will make those. I know, hope so. <laughs> build yeah. those bridges. Indeed. Steve, I want to thank you for talking to us today. Oh, it's been a real you. pleasure. Absolutely. I've been talking with Stephen Bita, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Oregon. He's currently working on a book project, Strong Winds and Widowmakers, A History of Workers, Nature, and Environmental Conflict in the Pacific Northwest Timber Country, 1900 to the Present. Thanks so much for watching. Mm -hmm.